Hey guys, welcome to another World Audiobooks. This is the second to last episode. We're almost done with Tarzan. Super excited to bring you the conclusion of this awesome book. Hope you guys have enjoyed it. If you have, make sure to leave a rating and review of the podcast. You can do that on iTunes. All the links are in the description. Thanks so much for listening and sharing the podcast with somebody. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. Now, without further ado, I give you Tarzan. Chapter 25. The Outpost of the World with the report of his gun, Dionaut saw the door fly open and the figure of a man pitch headlong within onto the cabin floor. The Frenchman, in his panic, raised his gun to fire again into the prostrate form, but suddenly, in the half-dusk of the open door, he saw that the man was white, and, in another instant, realized that he had shot his friend and protector, Tarzan of the Apes. With a cry of anguish, Dionaut sprang to the ape-man's side and, kneeling, lifted the latter's head in his arms, calling Tarzan's name aloud. There was no response, and then Dionot placed his ear above the man's heart. To his joy, he heard its steady beating beneath. Carefully, he lifted Tarzan to the cot, and then, after closing and bolting the door, he lighted one of the lamps and examined the wound. The bullet had struck a glancing blow upon the skull. There was an ugly flesh wound, but no signs of a fracture of the skull. Dionot breathed a sigh of relief and went about bathing the blood from Tarzan's face. Soon the cool water revived him, and presently he opened his eyes to look in questioning surprise at Dionot. The latter had bound the wound with pieces of cloth, and, as he saw that Tarzan had regained consciousness, he arose and, going to the table, wrote a message, which he handed to the ape-man, explaining the terrible mistake he had made, and how thankful he was that the wound was not more serious. Tarzan, after reading the message, sat on the edge of the couch and laughed. "'It is nothing,' he said in French, and then— his vocabulary failing him, he wrote, "'You should have seen what Bolgani did to me, and Kerchak, and Turkaz before I killed them. Then you would laugh at such a little scratch.' Dionot handed Tarzan the two messages that had been left for him. Tarzan read the first one through with a look of sorrow on his face. The second one he turned over and over, searching for an opening. He had never seen a sealed envelope before. At length he handed it to Dionot. The Frenchman had been watching him, and knew that Tarzan was puzzled over the envelope. How strange it seemed that to a full-grown white man an envelope was a mystery. Dionot opened it and handed the letter back to Tarzan. Sitting on a camp stool, the ape-man spread the written sheet before him and read, To Tarzan of the Apes Before I leave, let me add my thanks to those of Mr. Clayton for the kindness you have shown in permitting us to use your cabin. That you never came back to make friends with us has been a great regret to us. We should have liked so much to have seen and thanked our host. There is another I should like to thank also, but he did not come back, though I cannot believe that he is dead. I do not know his name. He is the great white giant who wore the diamond locket upon his breast. If you know him, and can speak his language, carry my thanks to him, and tell him that I waited seven days for him to return. Tell him, also, that in my home in America, in the city of Baltimore, there will always be a welcome for him if he cares to come. I found a note you wrote me lying among the leaves beneath the tree near the cabin. I do not know how you learned to love me, who have never spoken to me, and I am very sorry if it is true, for I have already given my heart to another. But know that I am always your friend, Jane Porter." Tarzan sat with gaze fixed upon the floor for nearly an hour. It was evident to him from the notes that they did not know that he and Tarzan of the Apes were one and the same. "'I have given my heart to another,' he repeated over and over again to himself. Then she did not love him. How could she have pretended love and raised him to such a pinnacle of hope only to cast him down to such utter depths of despair? Maybe her kisses were only signs of friendship.' How did he know, who knew nothing of the customs of human beings? Suddenly he arose, and, bidding Dale not good night as he had learned to do, threw himself upon the couch of ferns that had been Jane Porter's. Dale not extinguished the lamp, and lay down upon the cot. For a week they did little but rest, Dale not coaching Tarzan in French. At the end of that time, the two men could converse quite easily. One night, as they were sitting within the cabin before retiring, Tarzan turned to Dale not. "'Where is America?' he said. "'Dionot pointed toward the northwest. "'Many thousands of miles across the ocean,' he replied. "'Why?' "'I am going there.' "'Dionot shook his head. "'It is impossible, my friend,' he said. "'Tarzan rose, and going to one of the cupboards, "'returned with a well-thumbed geography. 
Turning to a map of the world, he said, I have never quite understood all this. Explain it to me, please. When they all not had done so, showing him that the blue represented all the water on the earth and the bits of other colors, the continents and islands, Tarzan asked him to point to the spot where they were now. Dale Nott did so. Now point out America, said Tarzan, and Dale Nott placed his finger upon North America. Tarzan smiled and laid his palm upon the page, spanning the great ocean that lay between the two continents. You see, it is not so very far, he said, scarce the width of my hand. Dale Nott laughed. How could he make the man understand? Then he took a pencil and made a tiny point upon the shore of Africa. This little mark, he said, is many times larger upon this map than your cabin is upon the earth. Do you see now how very far it is? Tarzan thought for a long time. Do any white men live in Africa? he asked. Yes. Where are the nearest? They are not pointed out a spot on the shore just north of them. So close? asked Tarzan in surprise. Oui said they are not. But it is not so close. Have they big boats to cross the ocean? Yes. We shall go there tomorrow, announced Tarzan. Again, Deonot smiled and shook his head. It is too far. We should die long before we reach them. Do you wish to stay here then forever? asked Tarzan. No, said Deonot. Then we shall start tomorrow. I do not like it here longer. I should rather die than remain here. Well, answered Deonot with a shrug, I do not know, my friend, but that I will also rather die than remain here. If you go, I shall go with you. It is settled, then, said Tarzan. I shall start for America tomorrow. How will you get to America without money? asked Deonot. What is his money? inquired Tarzan. It took a long time to make him understand, even imperfectly. How do men get money? he asked at last. They work for it? Very well, I will work for it then. No, my friend, returned they are not. You need not worry about money, nor need you to work for it. I have enough money for two, enough for twenty, much more than is good for one man, and you shall have all you need if we ever reach civilization. So, on the following day, they started north along the shore, each man carrying a rifle and ammunition, besides bedding and some food and cooking utensils. The latter seemed to Tarzan a most useless encumbrance, so he threw his away. But you must learn to eat cold food, my friend, remonstrated Dale Not. No civilized men eat raw flesh. There will be time enough when I reach civilization, said Tarzan. I do not like the things, and they only spoil the taste of good meat. For a month, they traveled north, sometimes finding food in plenty, and again going hungry for days. They saw no signs of natives, nor were they molested by wild beasts. Their journey was a miracle of ease. Tarzan asked questions and learned rapidly. They are not taught him many of the refinements of civilization, even to the use of knife and fork, but sometimes Tarzan would drop them in disgust and grasp his food in his strong brown hands, tearing it with his molars like a wild beast. Then Deonot would expostulate with him, saying, You must not eat like a brute, Tarzan, while I am trying to make a gentleman of you. Mon Dieu! Gentlemen, do not thus! It is terrible! Tarzan would grin sheepishly and pick up his knife and fork again, but at heart he hated them. On the journey, he told Deonot about the great chest he had seen the sailors bury, of how he had dug it up and carried it to the gathering place of the apes and buried it there. It must be the treasure chest of Professor Bauteur, said Deonot. It is too bad, but of course you do not know. Then Tarzan recalled the letter written by Jane to a friend, the one he had stolen when they first came to his cabin, and now he knew what was in the chest and what it meant to Jane. Tomorrow we shall go back after it, he announced to Deonot. Go back? exclaimed Deonot. But my dear fellow, we have now been three weeks upon the march. It will require three more to return to the treasure, and then, with that enormous weight which required, you say, four sailors to carry, it will be months before we again reach this spot. It must be done, my friend, insisted Tarzan. You may go on toward civilization, and I will return for the treasure. 
I can go very much faster alone. I have a better plan, Tarzan, exclaimed the Arnaut. We shall go on together to the nearest settlement, and there we will charter a boat and sail back down the coast for the treasure and so transport it easily. That will be safer and quicker, and also not require us to be separated. What do you think of that plan? Very well, said Tarzan. The treasure will be there whenever we go for it. And, well, I could fetch it now and catch up with you in a moon or two. I shall feel safer for you to know that you are not alone on the trail. When I see how helpless you are, Daronot, I often wonder how the human race has escaped annihilation, all these ages which you tell me about. Why, Sabor single-handed could exterminate a thousand of you. Daronot laughed. You would think more highly of our genius when you have seen its armies and navies, its great cities and mighty engineering works. Then you will realize that it is mind and not muscle that makes the human animal greater than the mighty beasts of the jungle. Alone and unarmed, a single man is no match for any of the larger beasts. But if ten men were together, they would combine their wits and their muscles against this savage enemy, while the beast, being unable to reason, would never think of combining against the men. Otherwise, Tarzan of the Apes, how long would you have lasted in this savage wilderness? You are right, dear not, replied Tarzan. For if Kerchak had come to Two Blot's aid that night of the Dum Dum, there would have been an end of me. But Kerchak could never think far enough ahead to take advantage of such opportunity. Even Kayla, my mother, could never plan ahead. She simply ate what she needed when she needed it. And if the supply was very scarce, even though she found plenty of several meals, she would never gather any ahead. I remember that she used to think it very silly of me to burden myself with extra food upon the march, though she was quite glad to eat it with me if the way chanced to be barren of sustenance. Then you knew your mother, Tarzan? asked Daonot in surprise. Yes, she was a great fine ape, larger than I, weighing twice as much. And your father? asked Daonot. I did not know him. Kayla told me that he was a white ape, and hairless like myself. I know that he must have been a white man. Daonot looked long and earnestly at his companion. Tarzan, he said at length, it is impossible that the ape Kayla was your mother. If such a thing can be, which I doubt, you would have inherited some of the characteristics of the ape, but you have not. You are a pure man, and I should say, the offspring of a highly bred and intelligent parents. Have you not the slightest clue of your past? Not the slightest, replied Tarzan. No writings in the cabin that might have told something of the lives of its original inmates? I've read everything that was in the cabin, with the exception of one book, which I know now to be written in a language other than English. Possibly you can read it. Tarzan fished the little black diary from the bottom of his quiver and handed it to his companion. They are not glanced at the title page. It is the diary of John Clayton, Lord Greystock, an English nobleman, and it is written in French, he said. Then he proceeded to read the diary that had been written over twenty years before, and which recorded the details of the story which we already know, the story of adventure, hardships, and sorrow of John Clayton and his wife Alice from the day they left England until an hour before he was struck down by Kerchak. They are not read aloud. At times his voice broke, and he was forced to stop reading for the pitiful hopelessness that spoke between the lines. Occasionally he glanced at Tarzan, but the ape-man sat upon his haunches like a carven image, his eyes fixed upon the ground. Only when the little babe was mentioned did the tone of the diary alter from the habitual tone of despair which had crept into it by degrees after the first two months upon the shore. Then the passages were tinged with a subdued happiness that was even sadder than the rest. One entry showed an almost hopeful spirit. Today our little boy is six months old. He is sitting in Alice's lap beside the table where I am writing, a happy, healthy, perfect child. Somehow, even against all reason, I seem to see him a grown man, taking his father's place in the world, the second John Clayton, and bringing added honours to the house of Greystoke. There, as though to give my prophecy the weight of his endorsement, he grabbed my pen in his chubby fists, and with his ink-begrimed little fingers has placed the seal of his tiny fingerprints upon the page. And there, on the margin of the page, were the partially blurred imprints of four wee fingers and the outer half of the thumb. When Daonot had finished the diary, the two men sat in silence for some minutes. "'Well, Tarzan of the Apes, what do you think?' asked Daonot. 
Does not this little book clear up the mystery of your parentage? Why, man, you are Lord Greystock. The book speaks of but one child, he replied. Its little skeleton lay in the crib, where it died crying for nourishment, from the first time I entered the cabin until Professor Porter's party buried it, with his father and mother beside the cabin. No, that was the babe the book speaks of, and the mystery of my origin is deeper than before, for I have thought much of late of the possibility of that cabin having been my birthplace. I am afraid that Kayla spoke the truth, he concluded sadly. Dale not shook his head. He was unconvinced, and in his mind had sprung the determination to prove the correctness of his theory, for he had discovered the key which alone could unlock the mystery, or consign it forever to the realms of the unfathomable. A week later, the two men came suddenly upon a clearing in the forest. In the distance were several buildings surrounded by a strong palisade. Between them and the enclosure stretched a cultivated field in which a number of negroes were working. The two halted at the edge of the jungle. Tarzan fitted his bow with a poisoned arrow, but Dale not placed a hand upon his arm. "'What would you do, Tarzan?' he asked. "'They will try to kill us if they see us,' replied Tarzan. "'I prefer to be the killer.' "'Maybe they are friends,' suggested Dale not. "'They are black,' was Tarzan's only reply, and again he drew back his shaft. "'You must not, Tarzan,' cried Dale not. White men do not kill wantonly, mon dieu, but you have much to learn. I pity the ruffian who crosses you, my wild man, when I take you to Paris. I will have my hands full keeping your neck from beneath the guillotine. Tarzan lowered his bow and smiled. I do not know why I should kill the blacks back there in my jungle, yet not kill them here. Suppose Numa, the lion, should spring out upon us. I should say then, I presume, good morning, Monsieur Numa. How is Madame Numa, eh? Wait until the blacks spring upon you replied Dale not. Then you may kill them. Do not assume that men are your enemies until they prove it. Come, said Tarzan. Let us go and present ourselves to be killed. And he started straight across the field, his head high held and the tropical sun beating upon his smooth brown skin. Behind him came Dale not, clothed in some garments which had been discarded at the cabin by Clayton when the officers of the French cruiser had fitted him out in a more presentable fashion. Presently, one of the blacks looked up, and, beholding Tarzan, turned shrieking toward the palisade. In an instant, the air was filled with cries of terror from the fleeing gardeners, but before they had reached the palisade, a white man emerged from the enclosure, rifle in hand, to discover the cause of the commotion. What he saw brought his rifle to his shoulder, and Tarzan of the apes would have felt cold lead once again, had not Dale not cried loudly to the man with the leveled gun. "'Do not fire! We are friends!' "'Hold, then!' was the reply. "'Stop Tarzan!' cried Dale not. "'He thinks we are enemies!' Tarzan dropped into a walk, and together he and Dale not advanced toward the white man by the gate. The latter eyed them in puzzled bewilderment. "'What manner of men are you?' he asked in French. "'What man?' replied Dale not. "'We have been lost in the jungle for a long time.' The man had lowered his rifle, and now advanced with outstretched hand. I am Father Constantine of the French mission here, he said, and I am glad to welcome you. This is Monsieur Tarzan, Father Constantine, replied Deonot, indicating the ape-man, and as the priest extended his hand to Tarzan, Deonot added, And I am Paul Deonot of the French Navy. Father Constantine took the hand which Tarzan extended in imitation of the priest's act, while the latter took in the superb physique and handsome face in one quick, keen glance. And thus came Tarzan of the Apes to the first outpost of civilization. For a week they remained there, and the ape-man, keenly observant, learned much of the ways of men. Meanwhile, black women sewed white duck garments for himself and Dale not, so that they might continue their journey properly clothed. Chapter 26 The Height of Civilization 
Another month brought them to a little group of buildings at the mouth of a wide river, and there Tarzan saw many boats, and was filled with the timidity of the wild thing by the sight of many men. Gradually he became accustomed to the strange noises and the odd ways of civilization, so that presently none might know that two short months before this handsome Frenchman in immaculate white ducks, who laughed and chatted with all of them, had been swinging naked through the primeval forest to pounce upon some unwary victim which, raw, was to fill his savage belly. The knife and fork, so contemptuously flung aside a month before, Tarzan now manipulated as exquisitely as did Polish day or not. So apt a pupil had he been that the young Frenchman had laboured assiduously to make of Tarzan of the Apes a Polish gentleman, in so far as nicety of manners and speech was concerned. "'God made you a gentleman at heart, my friend,' Deonot had said. "'But we want his works to show upon the exterior or so.' As soon as they had reached the little port, Deonot had cabled his government of his safety, and requested a three months leave, which had been granted. He had also cabled his bankers for funds, and the enforced wait of a month, under which both chafed, was due to their inability to charter a vessel for the return to Tarzan's jungle after the treasure. During their stay at the coast town, Monsieur Tarzan became the wonder of both whites and blacks, because of several occurrences which to Tarzan seemed the merest of nothings. Once, a huge black, crazed by drink, had run amuck and terrorized the town, until his evil star had led him to where the black-haired French giant lowed upon the veranda of the hotel. Mounting the broad steps with brandished knife, the negro made straight for a party of four men, sitting at a table, sipping the inevitable absinthe. Shouting in alarm, the four took to their heels, and then the black spied Tarzan. With a roar, he charged the ape-man, while a half-hundred heads peered from sheltering windows and doorways to witness the butchering of the poor Frenchman by the giant black. Tarzan met the rush with a fighting smile that the joy of battle always brought to his lips. As the negro closed upon him, steel muscles gripped the black wrist of the uplifted knife-hand, and a single swift wrench left the hand dangling below a broken bone. With the pain and surprise, the madness left the black man, and as Tarzan dropped back into his chair, the fellow turned, crying with agony, and dashed wildly toward the native village. On occasion, as Tarzan and Dale not sat at dinner with a number of other whites, the talk fell upon lions and lion hunting. Opinion was divided as to the bravery of the king of beasts, some maintaining that he was an errant coward, but all agreeing that it was with a feeling of greater security that they gripped their express rifles when the monarch of the jungle roared about a camp at night. Delnort and Tarzan had agreed that his past be kept secret, and so none other than the French officer knew of the ape-man's familiarity with the beasts of the jungle. "'Monsieur Tarzan has not expressed himself,' said one of the party. A man of his prowess, who has spent some time in Africa, as I understand Monsieur Tarzan has, must have had experiences with the lions, yes? So, replied Tarzan dryly, enough to know that each of you are right in your judgment of the characteristics of the lions, the ones that you have met, but one might as well judge all blacks by the fellow who ran amok last week, or decide that all whites are cowards because one has met a cowardly white. There is as much individuality among the lower orders, gentlemen, as there is among ourselves. Today we may go out and stumble upon a lion which is over-timid. He runs away from us. Tomorrow we may meet his uncle or his twin brother, and our friends wonder why we do not return from the jungle. For myself, I always assume that a lion is ferocious, and so I am never cut off my guard. There would be little pleasure in hunting, retorted the first speaker, if one is afraid of the thing he hunts. Dale not smiled. Tarzan afraid? I do not exactly understand what you mean by fear, said Tarzan. Like lions, fear is a different thing in different men. But to me, the only pleasure in the hunt is the knowledge that the hunted thing has power to harm me as much as I have to harm him. If I went out with a couple of rifles and a gun bearer and twenty or thirty beaters to hunt a lion, I should not feel that the lion had much chance. And so the pleasure of the hunt would be lessened in proportion to the increased safety which I felt. Then I take it that Monsieur Tarzan would prefer to go naked into the jungle, armed only with a jackknife to kill the king of beasts, laughed the other, good-naturedly, but with the merest touch of sarcasm in his tone. And a piece of rope, added Tarzan. Just then, the deep roar of a lion sounded from the distant jungle, as though to challenge whoever dared enter the lists with him. There is the opportunity, Monsieur Tarzan, bantered the Frenchman. "'I'm not hungry,' 
said Tarzan simply. The men laughed, all but they are not. He alone knew that a savage beast had spoken its simple reason through the lips of the ape-man. But you are afraid, just as any of us would be, to go out there naked, armed only with a knife and a piece of rope, said the banterer. Is it not so? No, replied Tarzan. Only a fool performs any act without reason. Five thousand francs is a reason, said the other. I wager you that amount. You cannot bring back a lion from the jungle under the conditions we have named, naked and armed only with a knife and a piece of rope. Tarzan glanced toward Deonot and nodded his head. Make it ten thousand, said Deonot. Dan, replied the other. Tarzan arose. I shall have to leave my clothes at the edge of the settlement, so that if I do not return before daylight, I shall have something to wear through the streets. You are not going now, exclaimed the wagerer. At night? Why not? asked Tarzan. Numa walks abroad at night. It will be easier to find him. No, said the other. I do not want your blood upon my hands. It will be foolhardy enough if you go forth by day. I will go now replied Tarzan, and went to his room for his knife and rope. The men accompanied him to the edge of the jungle, where he left his clothes in a small storehouse. But when he would have entered the blackness of the undergrowth, they tried to dissuade him, and the wagerer was most insistent of all that he abandoned his foolhardy venture. "'I would have seen that you have won,' he said. "'And the ten thousand francs are yours, if you will but give up this foolish attempt, which can only end in your death.' Tarzan laughed, and in another moment the jungle had swallowed him. The men stood silent for some moments, and then slowly turned and walked back to the hotel veranda. Tarzan had no sooner entered the jungle than he took to the trees, and it was with a feeling of exultant freedom that he swung once more through the forest branches. This was life. Ah, oh, how he loved it! Civilization had nothing like this in his narrow and circumscribed sphere— Hemmed in by restrictions and conventionalities, even clothes were a hindrance and a nuisance. At last, he was free. He had not realized what a prisoner he had been. How easy it would be to circle back to the coast, and then make toward the south and his own jungle and cabin. Now, he caught the scent of Numa, for he was traveling upwind. Presently, his quick ears detected the familiar sound of padded feet and the brushing of a huge, fur-clad body through the undergrowth. Tarzan came quietly above the unsuspecting beast, and silently stalked him until he came into a little patch of moonlight. Then the quick noose settled and tightened about the tawny throat, and, as he had done it a hundred times in the past, Tarzan made fast the end to a strong branch, and, while the beast fought and clawed for freedom, dropped to the ground behind him, and, leaping upon the great back, plunged his long, thin blade a dozen times into the fierce heart. With his foot upon the carcass of Numa, he raised his voice in the awesome cry of his savage tribe. For a moment, Tarzan stood irresolute, swayed by conflicting emotions of loyalty to Deonot and the mighty lusts of the freedom of his own jungle. At last, the vision of a beautiful face and the memory of warm lips crushed to his dissolved the fascinating picture he had been drawing of his old life. The ape-man threw the warm carcass of Numa across his shoulders and took to the trees once more. The men upon the veranda had sat for an hour, almost in silence. They had tried ineffectually to convene on various subjects, and always the thing uppermost in the mind of each had caused the conversation to lapse. "'Mon Dieu,' said the wagerer at length, "'I can endure it no longer. I am going into the jungle with my express and bring back that madman.' "'I will go with you,' said one. "'And I, and I, and I,' chorused the others. As though the suggestion had broken the spell of some horrid nightmare, they hastened to their various quarters, and presently were headed toward the jungle, each one heavily armed. "'Good! What was that?' suddenly cried one of the party, an Englishman, as Tarzan's savage cry came faintly to their ears. "'I heard the same thing once before,' said a Belgian. "'When I was in the gorilla country, my carrier said it was the cry of a great bull ape who was made a kill.' They had not remembered Clayton's description of the awful roar with which Tarzan had announced his kills, and he half smiled in spite of the horror which filled him to think that the uncanny sound could have issued from a human throat, from the lips of his friend. As the party stood finally near the edge of the jungle, debating as to the best distribution of their forces, they were startled by a low laugh near them, and turning, 
beheld advancing toward them a giant figure bearing a dead lion upon its broad shoulders. Even Deonot was thunderstruck, for it seemed impossible that the man could have so quickly dispatched a lion with the pitiful weapons he had taken, or that alone he could have borne the huge carcass through the tangled jungle. The men crowded about Tarzan with many questions, but his only answer was a laughing deprecation of his feet. To Tarzan, it was though one would eulogize a butcher for his heroism in killing a cow, for Tarzan had killed so often for food and for self-preservation that the axe seemed anything but remarkable to him. But he was indeed a hero in the eyes of these men, men accustomed to hunting big game. Incidentally, he had won ten thousand francs, for Deonot insisted that he keep it all. This was a very important item to Tarzan, who was just commencing to realize the power which lay beyond the little pieces of metal and paper which always changed hands when human beings rode or ate or slept or clothed themselves or drank or worked or played or sheltered themselves from the rain or cold or sun. It had become evident to Tarzan that without money one must die. Deonot had told him not to worry, since he had more than enough for both. But the ape-man was learning many things, and one of them was that people looked down upon one who accepted money from another without giving something of equal value in exchange. Shortly after the episode of the lion hunt, Deonot succeeded in chartering an ancient tub for the coastwise trip to Tarzan's landlocked harbour. It was a happy morning for both when the little vessel weighed anchor and made for the open sea. The trip to the beach was uneventful, and the morning after they dropped anchor before the cabin, Tarzan, garbed once more in his jungle regalia and carrying a spade, set out alone for the amphitheatre of the apes, where lay the treasure. Late the next day he returned, bearing the great chest upon his shoulder, and at sunrise the little vessel worked through the harbour's mouth and took up her northward journey. Three weeks later, Tarzan and Deonot were passengers on board a French steamer bound for Lyon and after a few days in that city, Deonot took Tarzan to Paris. The ape-man was anxious to proceed to America, but Deonot insisted that he must accompany him to Paris first, nor would he divulge the nature of the urgent necessity upon which he based his demand. One of the first things which Deonot accomplished after their arrival was to arrange to visit a high official of the police department, an old friend, and to take Tarzan with him. Adroitly, Deonot led the conversation from point to point, until the policeman had explained to the interested Tarzan many of the methods in vogue for apprehending and identifying criminals. Not the least interesting to Tarzan was the part played by fingerprints in this fascinating science. "'But of what value are these imprints?' asked Tarzan. "'When, after a few years, the lines upon the fingers are entirely changed by the wearing out of the old tissue and the growth of new.' "'The lines never change!' replied the official. From infancy to senility, the fingerprints of an individual change only in size, except after injuries, or to the loops or whorls. But if imprints have been taken of the thumb and four fingers of both hands, one must need lose all entirely to escape identification. It is marvellous, exclaimed Deonot. I wonder what the lines upon my own fingers may resemble. We can soon see, replied the police officer and ringing a bell, he summoned an assistant, to whom he issued a few directions. The man left the room, but presently returned with the little hardwood box which he placed on his superior's desk. Now, said the officer, you shall have your fingerprints in a second. He drew from the little case a square of plate glass, a little tube of thick ink, a rubber roller, and a few snowy white cards. Squeezing a drop of ink onto the glass, he spread it back and forth with a rubber roller until the entire surface of the glass was covered to his satisfaction with a very thin and uniform layer of ink. It plays the four fingers of your hand upon the glass thus, he said to Deonot. And now the thumb, that is right. Now place them in just the same position upon this card here. No, no, a little to the right. We must leave room for the thumb and the fingers of the left hand. There, that's it. Now the same with the left. Come, Tarzan cried Deonot. Let's see what your words look like. Tarzan complied readily, asking many questions of the officer during the operation. Do fingerprints show racial characteristics? he asked. Could you determine, for example, solely from fingerprints, whether the subject was Negro or Caucasian? I think not, replied the officer. Could the fingerprints of an ape be detected from those of a man? Probably, because the apes would be far simpler than those of the higher organism. But a cross between an ape and a man might show the characteristics of either progenitor, 
continued Tarzan. Yes, it could be like thee, responded the official. But the science has not progressed sufficiently to render it exact enough in such matters. I should hate to trust its finding further than to differentiate between individuals. There, it is absolute. No two people born into the world probably have ever had identical lines upon all their digits. It is very doubtful if any single fingerprint will ever be exactly duplicated by any finger other than the one which originally made it. Do the comparisons require much time or labor? As they are not. Ordinarily, but a few moments, if the impressions are distinct. They are not drew a little black book from his pocket and commenced turning the pages. Tarzan looked at the book in surprise. How did they are not come to have his book? Presently, they are not stopped on a page on which were five tiny little smudges. He handed the book to the policeman. Are these imprints similar to mine or Monsieur Tarzan's? Or can you say that they are identical with either? The officer drew a powerful glass from his desk and examined all three specimens carefully, making notations meanwhile upon a pad of paper. Tarzan realized now what was the meaning of their visit to the police officer. The answer to his life's riddle lay in these tiny marks. With tense nerves, he sat leaning forward in his chair, but suddenly he relaxed and dropped back, smiling. Dale not looked at him in surprise. You forget that for twenty years, the dead body of the child who made those fingerprints lay in the cabin of his father, and that all my life I have seen it lying there, said Tarzan bitterly. The policeman looked up in astonishment. Go ahead, Capitan, with your examination, said Deonot. We will tell you this story later, provided Monsieur Tarzan is agreeable. Tarzan nodded his head. But you are mad, my dear Deonot, he insisted. Those little fingers are buried on the west coast of Africa. I do not know about that, Tarzan, replied Deonot. It is possible, but if you are not the son of John Clayton, then how in heaven's name did you come into that godforsaken jungle where no white man other than John Clayton had ever set foot? You forget. Kayla, said Tarzan. I do not even consider her, replied Deonot. The friends had walked to the broad window overlooking the boulevard as they talked. For some time they stood there, gazing out upon the busy throng beneath, each wrapped in his own thoughts. It takes some time to compare fingerprints, thought Dale Nott, turning to look at the police officer. To his astonishment, he saw the official leaning back in his chair, hastily scanning the contents of the little black diary. Dale Nott coughed. The policeman looked up and, catching his eye, raised his finger to admonish silence. They all not turned back to the window, and presently the police officer spoke. Is it a man? He said. Both turned toward him. There is evidently a great deal at stake which must hinge to a greater or lesser extent upon the absolute correctness of this comparison. I therefore ask that you leave the entire matter in my hands until Monsieur de Carc, our expert, returns. It will be but a matter of a few days. I had hoped to know at once. Said they or not. Monsieur Tarzan sails for America tomorrow. I will promise that you can cable him a report within two weeks, replied the officer. But what it will be, I dare not say. There are resemblances, yet, well, we had better leave it for Monsieur Descartes to solve. All right, thanks guys so much for listening. Really appreciate you uh, tuning into the podcast today, as always. If you enjoy Another World Audiobooks and want it to continue, one of the best ways you can just show your support for the podcast is just by telling somebody that you know about the podcast. I'm sure you know somebody, something's popped into your head who would just love to have a free audiobook. So go ahead and share the podcast with them or share it on Facebook or any of the other social medias. You can check out all the links in the description. And uh, if you want to practically support the podcast, you can go to anchor.fm slash Another World Audiobooks and just click on support the podcast right there. And love to be able to partner with you in that way to continue bring you awesome content hope you enjoyed it now we'll come back next week for the end of tarzan of the apes and then after that we're gonna be starting another awesome book i can't wait so looking forward to it and with that we'll see you next time
Don't worry, you aren't the only one. You aren't the only business that needs help. You aren't the only person that has a hard time finding the right help at the right price. This is where Business Bloodline becomes your bloodline to temporary and permanent staffing. Business Bloodline specializes in hiring internet workers to creatively solve problems for your business. Business Bloodline does all the vetting and only delivers candidates that make sense for your needs and at a cost that you can afford. But 60 seconds isn't enough for me to tell you why hiring through Business Bloodline is safer, cheaper, and less time consuming. We would rather show you. To get more information or a business consultation, visit businessbloodline.com. If the job can be done on a computer, Business Bloodline can find a match. Visit businessbloodline.com and tell them that you heard about it on Another World Audiobooks to get 10% off your first hire. Remember to mention that you heard about it on Another World Audiobooks to get that 10% off. Businessbloodline.com